Good morning. Last week we heard from the Prime Minister. Today it's the turn of the Labour leader, the man who wants his job. It's nearly three years since he took to the stage. Where Keir Starmer's concerned, his enemies claim that excitement is in short supply. Yet for Labour, power is starting to feel tantalisingly close. After 13 years of failure under this government, the British public, the British people are crying out for hope and change. Dilemmas haven't disappeared for Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak, whether on strikes or Scotland, where there's a constitutional clash brewing over the vexed question of trans rights. The Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill is passed. The next. With the Prime Minister pondering blocking a controversial new Scottish law. Well, if a new law is passed that does impact the rest of the United Kingdom, it is important that the UK government receives advice on that before deciding what to do, if anything. But we have one big question this morning. Is Keir Starmer ready for the job? He's here with us live this morning. Sir Keir Starmer, who wants to be your Prime Minister. Fed up of the train strikes, Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, whose job it is to get things running, is here with us too. And with me at the desk, the hero villain of the drama Succession, the Emmy award-winning actor, Brian Cox. The former minister, now head of the Women and Equalities Committee at Westminster, Caroline Noakes. And the economist and banker, the boss of NatWest, Sir Howard Davies. Good morning, it's great to have you with us as ever. And for the first Sunday in a while, Prince Harry is not splashed all over every single front page of the Sunday papers. Let's take a look at what is going on. The Telegraph, interestingly, splashes with a story from Keir Starmer, who we'll hear from shortly about his bold message, he says, to shake up the NHS. The front of the Observer reports a cabinet split over how to pay NHS staff better to try to sort the strikes out. The Mirror and The Sun refer to that terrible story of a shooting in London yesterday. And the Conservative um, former leader, Boris Johnson, mentioned on the front of the Sunday Times with a mysterious £800,000 lending facility that apparently was at Boris Johnson's beck and call when he was in number 10. Maybe we'll have a chat about that in a moment. But first of all, um, Sir Herod, I'd like to start, unusually, with a bit of Good news. Now, it might have been measly, but there was actually some growth in the economy in November. Should we be relieved? No. No. Um, I, I think it's first of all to note that um, mostly these figures get revised. I mean, they could get revised up, but they could get revised down. So these are the first releases are quite unreliable, actually. And I think what um, most figures tell us, that the economy is pretty flat. I don't feel that there is a deep recession. On the way, that's not what we see in our numbers for spending or co company borrowing, etc. But on the other hand, business confidence is weak, business investment is weak, consumers are carrying on spending. So I think the simplest thing to think, think about the economy is it's flatlining at present. interesting because a lot of the political conversation has been around, you know, really terrible grim times. And you're actually saying, you know, flat, weak, maybe a bit kind of mediocre, but not anything dreadful. No, I think one thing people are forgetting is that households saved a lot of money in the COVID period. Most people were still in work, but they weren't allowed to spend. And so what we see in their bank accounts is that there's still quite a lot of savings. People have got a cushion, and so they can carry on with their savings for the moment. That causes me to think that there could be trouble ahead mm -hmm. when these savings run out. But for the moment, I think people are able to sustain their spending, and you can see that in the numbers. Well, the economy, of course, is one of the challenges for all the political parties. Um, Brian Cox, we're about to hear from Keir Starmer, and previously, you said that he had a long way to go. You used to be a staunch Labour supporter, now you support the SNP, but since you have been watching Keir Starmer, has he made up any ground, in your view? I think quite considerably, particularly about the national health. I think he's absolutely right, and I think it's been top-heavy for far, far too long. It's gone on for years. I mean, this is not a new thing. Mm -hmm. And the national health gets battered on a regular basis because of that, mm -hmm. exactly what Keir's been talking about, and I completely agree with him. Has he done enough, though, to get you back over to the Labour Party? 
not quite, <laughs> but my, uh, my, rela my relationship to Scottish independence is quite different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, see, I don't believe that there's a, I really don't believe that there's, this is a breakup of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. I think there's, it could be a different kind of United. I would like to see a United Federation mm -hmm. where each country comes into its own and its sense of autonomy and can contribute as a result to a united federation where the, everybody comes together. At the moment, it's top heavy mm -hmm. because it's very south orientated. And I feel that that needs to change, that needs to shift. OK, well, we'll hear what you make of him in a few minutes. But Caroline, um, your party's been miles behind Labour for a long time. And when I talk to some of your colleagues privately, some of them say, you know what, maybe it is actually just better if we go off to opposition for a while to after the, all the turmoil, we need to dust ourselves down, figure out what we're, what we're for. Do you think that might be the best thing for the Tory party? No, I don't. And I think it's an interesting perspective to think we'd be better in opposition. I think Keir, you could ask him the question whether he's enjoyed opposition <laughs> very much. It's, uh, I would imagine, hugely frustrating. I've never been in opposition. I came in in 2010 as part of the, the coalition um, and have seen Conservative uh, governments ever since. So, look, I think what we have to reflect on, it's a long time to the next general mm. election. We've still got another 18 months and uh, I think people are writing the Conservatives off far too soon. If a week is a long time in politics, what on earth is 18 months? Probably a lifetime. Thank you all three of you for now. We'll be back with you later on. Well, three years ago did feel like a lifetime. The UK was still in the EU. No one had really heard of coronavirus. And after the 2019 disaster for Labour, Sir Keir Starmer had just announced that he wanted to be the man to save the party and get the keys to number 10. He beat off his rivals and took what is sometimes described as the worst job in British <laughs> politics, becoming the leader of Her Majesty of, of, of Her Majesty's opposition. He's here now in the studio and here are some of the images from your time as a Labour leader um, and so here the accusation put to you has often been that you know you're a bit managerial maybe you're a bit boring you're not going to get people excited but actually maybe you've been a very canny political operator actually because you're 20 points ahead in the polls pretty consistently isn't the truth that actually far from being a bit boring you've quietly been pretty ruthless well Laura I took a very sort of straightforward approach to the task I had. The Labour Party lost in 2019. That was the worst election result since 1935. And many people thought that it would be impossible for the Labour Party to come from that defeat into government. So I said, we need to change our party. If you've lost that badly, you don't look at the electorate and say, what on earth were you doing? You look in the mirror and say, we need to change. And we set about changing the Labour Party. We had to expose the government as not fit really to govern and then to say if not them then why us that's been three years of hard work we've taken really tough decisions and we put ourselves in a good position as we go into 2023 but do you think you have been ruthless and maybe you're proud of that I mean some of your colleagues think actually you've pulled off a bit of a trick because privately you have been ruthless you've chucked people out of the front bench if they haven't towed the line you haven't let Jeremy Corbyn back into the party and crucially Crucially, you've ditched promises you made during the leadership campaign when they didn't suit you anymore. Well, let me just go through the change that we made, because obviously we had to tackle anti-Semitism. That was the first thing I said when I became leader of the party. And I was absolutely determined to see that through. But we've also been absolutely clear on our position on NATO, um, a proud member of NATO. We've changed fundamentally our relationship with business. And we are a changed Labour Party. But I don't think anybody looking in to do would. That? Of course, we've had to be ruthless. And those changes we made, whether it's anti Semitism, uh, whether it's NATO, whether it's relationship with business, of course, we had to be ruthless um, and to be absolutely clear. But the purpose of it was to restore the Labour Party as a party fit to serve our country. And that's why I said at my conference speech last year, country first, party second. And that's the approach I've taken for the last three years and the approach I'll take from now into the election. But part of that has been junking promises that you made to your party. Now, when you ran as leader, you said you would end outsourcing yeah. in the NHS. That's out. You said that you would abolish the welfare payment, universal credit. That's out. And one of our viewers, Edmund, wants to know, he says, if Keir Starmer has broken all of his pledges to the Labour Party, how can the country expect to trust a word he says? Well, what how I can people trust you when you have, you know, explicitly 
junked promises you made. Well, when I was running for leader, I made pledges which reflected my values. Um, since then, we're now, what, three years on, a lot has changed. As you said at the head of the programme, we've been through COVID. We are still going through uh, an awful conflict in Ukraine and the Tory government has done huge damage to our economy. What's that and got to do with you ditching a promise to end outsourcing in the NHS? Well, so far as the NHS is concerned, what we've said in the last week or two is we would make more use mm -hmm. of the private sector to clear waiting lists. Some use is being used, uh, is made already. We would make more use of that because we have to clear um, the waiting lists. Uh, and we're in the worst crisis we've ever seen for the NHS. But do you but want people to trust you, though? Because this is about you making commitments and then changing your mind. Is it important for people to be able to trust what you say? I think, Laura, people will look at a leader of the opposition and say, is that someone who's prepared to take the tough decisions according to the facts as they now are. This wasn't so, my question. My question is, do you think it's important for people to well, be able to trust is. you? Of, of course, course it is. is. Of course so it let's is. take another one of those promises then. You promised that you would scrap tuition fees. Now, does that promise stand? Well, look, I think the tuition fee system needs to be changed. I don't think it's working. I don't think anybody would say it's working. But looking at the damage that's been done to the economy, um, Rachel Reeves and I have had to be very clear that we will only make commitments that we can afford at the next general election. So, that so promise... we need to look at that promise again. But I think, Laura, in, in terms of trust, mm -hmm. I'm not sure you're right to assume that the public will say um, that they prefer someone mm -hmm. who sort of dogmatically mm -hmm. insists that whatever was the position before can never change, even when the circumstances have changed. The damage done to our economy is huge. We're going to inherit um, a weakened, damaged economy. Now, we have to be prepared for that. And mm -hmm. that's why I've called for a decade of national renewal. We will but not on, be able to this, do everything but, but we need to do in the first five years of a but, Labour but government. But on this specific promise, it sounds very much like you are going to also to ditch your promise to scrap tuition fees. And there may be very good reason for that. I'm not saying it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but I think not very subtly, you're basically saying that that promise is also for the chop. What I'm saying, and I think most people watching this, looking at the chaos of the country, the damage that we've done, is that we'll go into that election ensuring that every single commitment that we make is fully costed. I think what and people every listening will hear, be kept. Keir Starmer, actually, is you not want... saying you're still going to scrap tuition fees. On tuition fees, I want to see change. I don't think it works. But I've said at my conference speech last year, um, there are things, good Labour things, that we would mm -hmm. want to do, but because of the damage the Tories have done, we won't be able to do. And there is so much that we need to fix. My, mm -hmm. my focus has to be on stabilising the economy and growing it, on restoring our public services and reforming them so they're fit for purpose. And I think having that narrow focus as we go into the election will be absolutely fundamental because people are crying out for hope, for change, for, for light be, at the end of the tunnel, really, and we need to but, provide and, and that. I, and we will move on, but I just want to be crystal clear, whether for young people watching this morning or for parents watching this morning, as things stand, you are no longer promising that you would get rid of tuition fees. That's clear from what you've said. No, we're looking at the options, Laura. We haven't yeah, got so a settled view you'd on get rid it. Of them. Okay. What I won't do is make commitments mm -hmm. that we can't keep, given the damage that's been done to the economy. And on that specific point about the damage to the economy, um, one of our viewers, Andrew Douglas got in touch. He wants to know, will Keir Starmer be as bold as his colleague Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, who said this week that Brexit is to blame for many of the country's economic problems? Will uh, you? Well, I don't think the deal that the government has brought in is a very good deal and I think it's doing damage to our economy and so of course we will need to repair that. There's no going back into the EU, there's no going back into the single market, but I do think there's a case for a closer trading relationship with Europe. I absolutely think there's a case for fixing the protocol in Northern Ireland. I made a speech about there, that this week. And you were there this week. week. I absolutely think there's a case for closer uh, cooperation on security. I think the Ukraine conflict mm -hmm. has showed that the EU, the UK and NATO working together can have but a closer again, relationship. Black and white, so you... there are things we can do to improve the situation we're in. But that doesn't mean going back to the EU. It doesn't mean going back to the And you've said many market. times you don't want to have the argument again. I think a lot of people watching might think that but, they don't but, want but, to but have but the closer, argument again either. A closer trade want... relationship, for example, would do a lot to improve our economy. 
and of course would ease tensions in Northern Ireland because one of the biggest problems with the protocol is if there's a difference in Northern Ireland from the rest of the United and Kingdom. I know you don't want to have the argument again about whether or not we go back into the European Union, even though some people in your party would like you to say that you would go back into the European Union. But do you still think that Brexit was a mistake? Well, look, I voted for Remain. Um, I campaigned for Remain, but we put it to the public in a referendum. Uh, they voted to leave. We have left, and now we have to make but it do work. do you still think it was a mistake? Because well, you were campaigning to overturn the result. So unless you've had a personality transplant since 2016... Well, of course, I, I wanted a different result. Of course I did. That's why I campaigned for Remain. Uh, I wanted a different result in all the elections we had. That's why I want to win the next general election. Um, but I'm focused on the future. We have left. Uh, we now have to have a better trading relationship. I don't think the, the, the deal that was supposed to be oven ready isn't at all but a good deal you, for our country. You we need to change that. keep saying a closer that. trading relationship because some people would say if you want a closer trading relationship, the only real way to have that is to go back into the single I market. I don't agree with so that what, at all. So what do, you, what do you mean then, briefly, look, if you can? Laura, I'm talking to European leaders, of course I am, about how we could have a closer trading relationship. But they're not saying to me, Kia, you must be in the single market, otherwise there's no prospect of a closer trading relationship. And I think that's a mistake to say. You're either stuck with Johnson's awful deal, which isn't working, um, or you've got to go back into the EU. I don't accept that for a moment. And nobody who knows about this, talking about this across mm. Europe, thinks that's a position um, at all. But do you think, in your view, will we always be poorer as a result of leaving the EU and being outside the single market? Is that your view? Well, look, Laura, I think we've got to um, go forward and make Brexit work. I think that is a closer trading relationship. But there are other parts of our economy that we need to fix. But that, you... wasn't, that wasn't my question, though. In your view, as Keir Starmer, who was an ardent Remainer, I, I, made the I'm, case I'm... very hard, do you think we'll always be poor? The economy will always be smaller as, for as long as we stay outside of the European Union? No, so, long, so long as we improve on the deal we've got, I don't accept that. And I don't think, you know, what people desperately want uh, going into the election is to feel there's light at the end of the tunnel, that things can get better. Um, and I would also add this, the economy has not grown mm. significantly for 13 years. That's been an absolute failure of this government. So even before Brexit, we had a failure under this Tory government with our economy. I'm determined that we will fix that. And that's why we set out our plans at conference for a green prosperity plan. That's why I've said so much about partnership working with mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. And why I've said so much make sh about making sure that the economy grows everywhere across the United Kingdom. And that's the utter focus of my attention. OK. What's also a focus of your attention and a lot of politicians and a lot of our viewers at the moment also is the health service. Yes. So we all know there are terrible problems with the NHS. And you and your team have been, you know, throwing some punches on this recently, or even on the front page of The Telegraph, yes. a conservative paper this morning, uh, talking about the need for reform, but also using some pretty choice language. You talk about bureaucratic nonsense. You talk about mundane inconvenience, mind-boggling wastes of time and money. Now, that's, that's not normally how we're accustomed to hearing Labour leaders talk about the health service. But when it comes to sorting things out, is anything off the table for you? Well, no, we want to look at all sorts of reform. But, Laura, the reason I want to reform the health service is because I want to preserve it. I think if we don't um, reform the health service, we will be in managed decline. Um, we are, the, the health service is in the worst position it's been in its entire history under the, uh, under the Tories. So we have to, of course, fix the immediate mm. problem. But in the long term, we have to recognise we need change. But that's Partly very interesting. it's that bureaucracy. Anybody who's been on the 8 o'clock call trying to get a GP appointment knows exactly what I'm talking but about. That's very but partly it's also we're living longer. We need a preventative approach. Mm -hmm. We need intervention. The, the, you know, it will always have to be free at the point of use. It, of course should be a public service, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use effectively the but, private sector as well. But that's very interesting. You say nothing is on the, off the table, but it still must be free at the point of use. Can you ever see a changing, a, cha a way to the funding operates? Some people say actually we should move to a social insurance kind of model. No, look, free at the point of use is the founding principle for the NHS and it's absolutely fundamental to me. But my strong view, I, I've been a reformer of public services for a very long time. I obviously ran a public service for five years, the Crown Prosecution mm -hmm. Service, and I could see that we needed to reform. 
And we did reform. We made huge changes when I was director of public prosecutions. There will always be people who say, don't change, keep it as it is. But actually, it's only those people who are bold enough, courageous enough to change our public services that genuinely believe in our public services. And for me, uh, it's not the private sector that is the reform we're looking for. Mm -hmm. I want a preventative model. We are living longer. This is a fantastic thing, but it means the health service has to change. But can you so ever intervention see a earlier, where the NHS more use does of technology. Less, though, can you ever see a situation where the NHS does less? Do we have to have that conversation? Because interestingly, one of your colleagues in Wales, the health minister there, she said maybe the NHS might have to do less in future. Well, in some cases, I do hope that we can lift the burden. One of the proposals we've put forward is, would it not be possible to consider self-referral so that individuals don't have to go to a doctor, uh, use up a doctor's time in order mm -hmm. to get referred to specialist help? If you've got back pain and you want to see a mm -hmm. physio, it ought to be possible, I think, to self-refer. If you've got internal bleeding and mm -hmm. you just need a test, there ought to be a way that uh, doesn't involve going to see a GP. So we do need to lift the burden, but we also need to change. But, you know, this is one of the things going into this year that I've charged my team with, with West Street, and I said, look, if the NHS is to survive, I need you to come up with proposals mm -hmm. for reform. Mm -hmm. To Bridget Phillipson, the Education uh, Shadow Secretary, I said, we need to reform when it comes to childcare and skills. And, we've uh, to uh, her here and here, Jonathan here, Ashworth, here when it comes plan. to over 50s coming back into work. So what I've asked all of my team to do is, you know, we've got to fix the immediate problems mm -hmm. that we face because mm -hmm. the country, it feels like the country is completely broken. But, when you but we've also got to do the longer term work. But when you talk about the problems of the country, you know, you're never a few seconds away from blaming the Conservatives for the problems of the country. But when it comes to the NHS, actually, if you look at the NHS in Wales, which is run by the Labour administration yeah. there, its problems are just as bad in most areas, in some areas worse. So if it's the Conservatives' fault in England, surely it's Labour's fault in Wales. Well, look, there are challenges, I accept that, whether it's in England or whether it's in Wales. And um, I'd say two things in response to that, Laura. Um, the first is that the real comparison, now we're 13 years into this government, ought to be with the 13 years of the last Labour government. And under the last Labour government, what you saw for the NHS was investment was up, waiting lists were down, mm -hmm. nurses had fair pay and they weren't on strike. So there was a massive difference between these 13 years and the previous 13 years. But let me, you know, there are, there are short-term issues that we need to do. We've got to get through this winter of mm -hmm. crisis. But, um, and this was a speech I did two weeks ago, my sort of mm -hmm. New Year's speech was to say that we've got to get away from what I call sticking plaster politics, which mm -hmm. is where we just fix the immediate problem, but we don't do the long-term strategic work to reform and change, whether it's the economy, whether it's public services. And that, that is self-defeating. We've had 13 years mm -hmm. now of, of worse and worse winter crisis for the NHS. If we don't do the long-term work, we'll have another crisis so next winter, another one that we... Uh, and that's not good enough. And so you're saying there's a lot of things on your list that you would like to fix. There's a lot of things on our list also to get yeah. through. Just before we move on, just a very straightforward answer, please. We asked the Prime Minister last week, I'll ask you today, have you ever used private health care? No ever at all? No. OK, let's move on. Now, if you are Prime Minister, if you win and you get the keys to number 10, would you allow people to change their gender without a medical diagnosis to do it more quickly and to bring in a system of what's known as gender self-identification? Well, I think we need to modernise the process and we're looking in the Labour Party what that process should be. Um, I start this discussion um, on with two premises work. Firstly, I think the British public are um, respectful and tolerant. Um, and secondly, I think that, you know, it's obvious that 99.9% of, of women, the issue is biological. There have been huge strides in women's rights, led very often by the Labour Party. And I'm very keen that we preserve that as we go forward. And that includes things like um, safe spaces. But there are a small number of people um, who uh, don't identify with the gender that they're born mm -hmm. into. There is a process that they can go through at the moment. Um, there are indignities in that process that I think can be improved through modernising the legislation. So you want to but modern... what I don't want to get drawn into is mm -hmm. the usual toxic political football that this always seems to become. And, and, and far from it, we want to have a respectful conversation about this, but our viewers have been in touch wanting to know what your position would be. So would you, as the Scottish Government has done, as Scottish Labour voted for, would you introduce or look to introduce a system of self 
certification? Well, we want to modernise the system. We're looking at what the options are. There are all sorts of that's, different that's... definitions in relation to self-certification. I don't, I mean, so far as the Scotland um, provision is concerned, um, I do have concerns about, one, the age of transition reduced now to 16, and we put amendments forward in relation to that, and also the primacy of the Equality Act, but which you're... is very important when it comes to things but like to be, safe but spaces. To, be, to explain to our viewers, though, Scottish Labour MSPs in the Scottish Parliament backed that system in the last couple of weeks. They supported it. Were they wrong to support it then? Well, that was a matter for Scottish Labour. Are Laura, I'm telling, you, I'm telling you what the position is in relation to uh, the whole Labour Party. Our position is that we want to modernise the legislation and to make sure that um, some of the indignities that are there in the process are taken out of the process. And I, when I say, look, for 99.9% mm. of women, it is biological and their rights must be preserved. Um, equality is very important to the Labour Party. Most people say, I agree with you, Keir, on that. When I also say, but there is a small number of people uh, you know, born and with a gender they don't identify with and they need to be treated with respect. Most people, actually, across the country say, well, that seems a position I can support as well. And you have made well. that point. But politicians don't just have to make points. They have to make choices. And in Scotland, your party and the SN back the SNP's attempt to change the law to make it easier for people to change gender without having a medical diagnosis and to do it at 16. Now you've said you have concerns about that, but do you then, and are you saying this morning, you don't support the law that has been introduced in Scotland? Well, we put down amendments which unfortunately didn't carry a but, relationship But your MSPs that. voted for it, Keir Summer. I'm asking you really straightforwardly, yes. The law's been changed in Scotland. There's a separate conversation about whether or not the UK yeah, government Yeah, my answer, Laura, is I have concerns about the provision in Scotland, in particular uh, the age reduction mm -hmm. to 16, in particular um, the rejection of our amendment in relation to the Equalities Act. So in but principle, across the whole of the area, I think we should modernise the law and I think we need a respectful debate that recognises um, you know, the different arguments that are being made. At the moment, this is just treated as a political football from start to finish and I don't think that actually advances the cause of anyone frankly. and, and we're and that but, but that's why also I think people want to know really clearly what your position is rather than having modernized sort of top... the legislation to take out the indignities but do you therefore not back this happening at 16 it sounds to me that's what you, what you are saying you would not agree that you are old enough at the age of 16 no I don't I don't think you are you don't think you are at 16 uh, okay that's clear would you if you were Prime Minister therefore as the government is considering doing would you block the legislation that Scotland has passed well the government's floated some ideas about what it might do we haven't seen that yet I think they're taking more legal advice so I'll wait and see what the government actually says in relation to that. But would you consider blocking it? Well, I will wait and see what the government says about this. They floated a number of ideas in the media last week and Saturday. Um, let's actually see what they put on the table but, but this Christopher, week. But used to be one of the most senior lawyers in the country. I mean, you, you know the law very, very well. I'm not sure really you are waiting to see what the government is saying. I'm, I'm asking you if you would think about blocking it if you were Prime Minister. Look, Laura... I'm going to wait and see what the government says. They've floated a number of ideas. I'll wait and see where they end up if they do in the coming days. I just want to ask you a couple of specific more things on this topic. Some women feel very strongly and worry that the law that's been passed in Scotland puts them at risk, does it? Well, one of the reasons I've been very clear about the importance of the Equality Act is because, for example, safe spaces are very, very important for women, and I completely understand that. When I was Director of Public Prosecutions, I did a lot of work with women who had been victims of sexual violence and domestic violence. But, but is it your and belief so that very, this new law puts them at risk? I, I, I'm very keen to preserve their safe spaces. The, 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 the new law, the, the two concerns I had, as I've said, are one, the age, and secondly, um, the fact that our amendment under the Equalities Act was not um, accepted. And so, um, you know, safe spaces for women are important. It's something I fundamentally believe in. Um, and that's why I've got concerns about mm. the fact that our amendment was not accepted. OK, well, it is a complicated conversation. Yeah. It's interesting. We had a lot of emails from viewers wanting to know what your position was this morning. Um, on to a different subject. Um, if, like John Major was when Charles and Diana were having terrible angst in their marriage, John Major was asked to intervene. If you were asked to intervene in the royal 
unhappiness at the moment, would you, as Prime Minister? No. You wouldn't I intervene? I don't think that um, politicians wading in to the current um, disputes um, is helpful at all. Um, you know, I think it's very sad that um, the royal family is going through this anguish, not least um, you know, because of the passing of the late Queen in the autumn of last year. But I don't think politicians wading in helps them or anybody else. But even if you were asked to help privately, as Sir John Major was back in the day, you'd say, you'd say no, nothing, nothing to do with me? Well, look, Laura, we're not in that position. But I, I know some politicians like wading in and have been wading in in the last week or two. I'm not going to do that. If over just thinking over the back, uh, sorry, if you, if, if you just think back over the last three eventful years, you have sometimes criticize, been criticised perhaps a, a, a bit as you did just then for sitting back a bit, not always wading in, not always being on the front foot. And some people in your party have even said you've sometimes been a bit slow, a bit sort of leaden footed and too cautious. But do you feel now your strategy is paying off? Yes. I mean, uh, look, if there's one thing that's absolutely bolted on and guaranteed as leader of the opposition, it is that everybody has a view on what you should be doing <laughs> and everybody thinks they could do a better job than you could. Um, and so I've had no end of advice and continue to get no Helpful end of advice. advice. <laughs> well, you get everybody saying, oh, if only he did that, it'd be better if he did that. My, I've had to be single-minded mm -hmm. in relation to this. I knew what I had to do which was to change the Labour Party, to expose the government as not fit to govern and to put forward the um, case for hope and change under the Labour Party. And I've been, um, if you like, I've, I've pushed the noise to one side and concentrated on the job that I needed to do. And it's not about me. The Labour Party, uh, what, the Labour Party has to be a party mm -hmm. fit to serve our country. And it is now a party fit to serve our country. But we also have to answer um, not just the short-term problems that our country is facing, but the long-term um, issues as well to bring about the change that we need so for Keir our Starmer, country. So, so Keir Starmer was the tortoise, not the hare, who now thinks he's going to win well, the Well, look, Laura, I, you know, you can pick whatever description, and I've seen plenty of descriptions. Um, and frankly, it's water for duck's back. I know what I've got to do. I'm not doing a it for... A duck, not a tortoise or a hare. I'm, I'm not like, doing it for me. I, this I, when I was a child, I didn't dream of being Prime Minister. When I came into Parliament, I didn't dream of being Prime Minister. Really? For me, no, not at all. This is duty. This is um, the obligation to serve our country and to improve the lives. And we were talking earlier about being in opposition. There's nothing worse than being in opposition. I've been in opposition all the time I've been in Parliament. That means we vote, we lose, we don't change lives. We need to be a party capable of going into power. I've been utterly focused on that. And people, from day one, people were saying to me, oh, Keir, put out your bold ideas now. Don't, you know, concentrate so much on changing the party. Wrong. So I've persevered. I've had a strategy. I think we've been vindicated. Um, I know there's a long way to go. I tell the Shadow Cabinet every time we meet to fight like we're 5% behind in the polls. Every vote has to be earned. Uh, if you think of what's happened in the last year, a lot has changed. Mm. A lot will change in the next year. So, you know, if other people will let me, I'm going to carry on with my focused, determined approach that will get us, I hope, from the worst election results since 1935 into a position where we can form a, next, uh, a last, Labour government uh, in the next that's election. that's my last question, really. Do you have a concern that there is a risk of being overconfident? There is a risk of it, but I'm absolutely determined uh, that we won't take that risk. Um, and so earn every vote, um, make the case to serve our country and fight like we're five points behind in the polls all of the time. OK, Keir Starmer, thank you very much for coming in. We'll see what happens with those polls in the next few months. It's never quiet in British politics. Thank you very much for coming in. Now, let's dissect that a little bit with our panel who've come in to be with us today for the hour to help us decode what's really going on. Um, Howard Davis is somebody who used to be a deputy governor at the Bank of England. You now, I think, are responsible for £25 billion at NatWest. Um, what did you make of what Keir Starmer said about the impact of Brexit on the economy? He was a bit reluctant to sort of point fingers at it being part of the problem, although maybe he got there in the end. What did you think? Well, I guess his problem is that if he isn't planning to take us back into the single market or the EU, then accepting the economic consequences sounds a little bit negative. But I think the reality is that the economy is smaller 
almost all economists believe that the economy is about 5% smaller or will be over, over a period of five years or so. Um, and that is a significant handicap. And it is one of the reasons why we are now at the bottom of the growth table uh, in the major industrialized countries. We're the only country which has not recovered GDP to back before um, to back what it was before COVID. So I think we have to accept that is a significant handicap. It's one we brought on ourselves. Brian Cox, what was your overall impression? Um, <laughs> mixed, really. Um, I, I'm, very, uh, I'm very proud of Scotland for, for doing the Gender Identification Act because I think that is, uh, that's long needed. And it's a debate that has to happen. I'm, I do question the 16 thing, but that's my own personal feeling. But I do feel we need to address that, and I think that's absolutely right. As far as, um, as, far as the economy is concerned, well, of course it's shrunk because we are no longer that particular island that we have been. And so we've lost that power, and therefore we have to rethink who we are. And this is, I think this is really the beginning of a whole process of rethinking who we are. Uh, and I think since the passing of uh, the, uh, you know, our wonderful late Queen, I think we've had to consider it. We've had to consider the monarchy, and we're seeing it in relationship to what's been going on in the book Spare, mm -hmm. the Harry situation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of massive rethinking that needs to be done. And as part of that rethinking, a lot of people are thinking about identity. And on that question of the, the, the gender-based debate, it's been very, very controversial in Scotland. There's been a lot of abuse flying around, not least at J.K. Rowling, who has sort of become a, a leader for a particular group of, of, yeah. of people who've got real concerns. What do you make of the way that she has been treated? I think I don't like the way she's been treated, actually. I think she's entitled to her opinion. She's entitled to say what she feels. As a woman, she's very much entitled to say what she feels about her own body. And there's nobody better to say that as, as a woman. So I, I, I do feel that people have been a bit high and mighty about their attitude towards J.K. Rowling, quite yeah. frankly. It's been, Caroline, very fraught in Scotland and it is likely that there's you know going to be a lot more tense discussions around this whole issue also in Westminster too and we know as we were discussing with Keir Starmer that the government in Westminster is considering blocking the change of law that's been had in Scotland. Do you think they should block it because it would be the first time that a government at Westminster has ever stopped a law being changed in Scotland like that? Well, look, um, and I chair a select committee which recommended a raft of proposals which are broadly in line mm -hmm. with what the Scottish Government has done. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, I think it would be grossly hypocritical of me to say, yes, the government should block it. Mm -hmm. But there are real legal and constitutional implications of this. I think using Section 35 of the Scotland Act mm -hmm on this particular issue. To slam the brakes on. It absolutely looks, um, looks like an odd issue to pick your constitutional fight over. I think it's really important to reflect that whilst all sorts of toxic allegations are thrown around in this debate from turf uh, used as a term of abuse on one to some really quite aggressive tactics uh, from those who are very passionately committed mm. to additional trans rights on the other, the vast majority of people are right in the middle and they want to see trans people treated with respect. They also want to make sure, as I do, mm -hmm. that women's rights are absolutely upheld and that there are safe spaces uh, for single sex but protections some like in refuges. Your party, maybe some people in the government actually seem quite happy to stir this up. I mean, are you uncomfortable about it? Oh, I'm very uncomfortable about uh, gender wars. I'm very uncomfortable about having some sort of culture war about this. I think what is absolutely imperative is that we treat everybody with respect and we try to have a debate around gender identification that recognises the reality. There are people who uh, are born in the wrong body, who work incredibly hard their entire lifetime to get the recognition for the person that they are. And my committee has taken private evidence from individuals, from trans people, and listening to their struggles, listening to the discrimination and the abuse that they have faced. I absolutely believe we have to make the process simpler and kinder, um, but I, I really fear the use of this as some sort of woke culture war mm -hmm. to sow division and to make life harder on both sides of the argument. And yes or no, do you think your party, some people in your party are trying to use it as a, as a, as a sort of battering ram in a debate? Well, I think that's very obvious. Absolutely, yes. OK. Howard Davis, I was interested there to hear Keir Starmer not quite say that he's going to junk the uh, promise to abolish tuition fees, but I think his direction of travel is pretty clear. 
What are the economics of that? I mean, is it just too expensive to do right now in, if you look at the state of public spending? Well, it depends if you're going to replace the income for the universities uh, or not. Mm. What is quite interesting is that this has been unchanged now for 12 years. Mm. During that time, we've had inflation averaging about 2 or 3 per cent, plus then a year of 10 per cent. So actually, the amount the universities are getting has fallen very sharply in real terms without the government doing anything, if you like. So there has been a change in policy by this government already. But if you were to remove all of that tuition fee, mm -hmm. then and replace it all with government spending, that would be very difficult to afford given the fiscal profile. So I think I can understand why he's a bit cautious now about saying I'm going to can all this because since the trust Quateng adventure and what we realised that there were some constraints on how much the government could borrow, mm. spending all that money is looking hard. OK, well, they might be gone, but they've certainly got a legacy in how it's changed <laughs> the political debate. Um, Brian Cox, you said there that you were proud of how Scotland has um, changed the law and gender recognition. As somebody who's and committed to the independence movement. It was very interesting what you were saying earlier about having a federalised UK. Um, are you frustrated that Nicola Sturgeon may be going back on her promise to use the general I election as a referendum? Been, we, you know, you're a fellow Scot, so you understand the word canny. I do understand the word canny. And I think she's being very canny, and I think she's in a, she should be canny, given the situation, and it's a hot potato. It's mm -hmm. been a, you know, a hot potato for a long time, as gender identification is. So I think she's, I think she's following the right course. Uh, if you consider what happened in... Uh, well, what happened in the, the Catalan uh, mm -hmm. referendum. In which Spain, were, where they, yeah. a, a part and of it, the country and it, wanted And it was an illegal referendum, mm -hmm. and they suffered as a result. Mm -hmm. So she has to be very, very careful that we are doing it the right way. But there's real frustration among some SNP members and supporters. You know, she had this sort of uh, smiley meeting with Rishi Sunak this week, and then she's talked about having the general election as a de facto referendum on independence, but actually now that might be the Holyrood election the year after. There are some people in the movement who think it's kind of on the never never and they're and they're frustrated I, of course they're frustrated and they've every right to be frustrated it's a very frustrating situation we are trying to get an independent country and it's an impossible task but it's, it's a well it's not impossible it's it's <laughs> it seems impossible i think it's possible sorry i should that was a wrong phrase of mine uh, no i think it's possible but it seems overwhelming mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. and i think that the I think Nicola's the right person. She's done a great job, and I think her canniness is what will actually get us there in the end. Okay. But if we went like a bull in a china shop, we could be very, it could, it could damage us. Okay, so well, we have to be very careful about it, and we have to pursue what we want, what we need, what we feel our country needs. And this is what's interesting about these debates. It's very interesting the way. Keir then sort of said, well, that's the Scottish Labour Party. Mm. And I thought, well, I always thought that was the same party. Mm. And, of course, clearly it, there are different problems that are in Scotland, as in Wales, as in Ireland, mm -hmm. than there are in England. So, mm -hmm. And it's these problems it's that, that are not... Patchwork. Yeah, exactly, and they're not actually being recognised for mm. what they are. OK, Caroline, one thing that some people might think is mission impossible, but the newspapers talk about a lot, and some of your colleagues talk about a lot, is a comeback, possibly, from... Boris Johnson, who is in the Sunday Times today with this financial relationship where apparently he had a sort of credit facility of £800,000 with somebody who was a, a, a distant member of his family. Um, is it possible, in your view, for him to come back? Or what would you say to colleagues who are trying to stir the pot and make it happen? Oh, look, I don't think you can legitimately bring back a prime minister, have another prime minister without a general election. I would caution colleagues to look at the polls and decide whether that's a good idea. Look, Boris was a particular politician for a particular time. He did a brilliant job in 2019. Even Keir earlier acknowledged what a disastrous result that had been for mm. the Labour Party. But now is not his time. We need sensible grown-up politicians who are going to tackle the issues that the country is facing with determination, with, uh, I would argue, with thought and with uh, careful policies. And I think that's exactly what Rishi has put in place. Fair to we say you were never a fan of Mr Johnson, but your colleagues who are trying to bring him back, what would you, what would you say to them and what are they up to? I would say that their actions are destabilising the party. We've got 18 mm -hmm. months before the general election. Mm -hmm. We need to be united to go into that. Briefly, Howard, what would the market say if Boris Johnson came back? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> I think that wouldn't be uh, well received at this point because people would not have a clue what his economic 
policy was. And unfortunately, running the country is not quite the same as running his own finances, where it seems that there are mysterious people prepared to fill any budget gaps. That's not the case. <laughs> Could uh, be quite for handy, though, for the country if there were people, you know, just mysteriously around with deep pockets, always willing to help out. Anyway, um, there are still fans of Boris Johnson who we hear from sometimes in this programme, but I think the view from, from, from our panel this morning has been quite clear. So we've heard what they have to say about Keir Starmer. And of course, we want to hear, as ever, from you. You can email us, as ever, kunzberg at bbc.co.uk or use the hashtag BBC Laura Kay on social media. And always, always, there's tons on the BBC News website, also with analysis of our interviews on the programme today. Now, it's not easy for Labour or anyone to work out how to cope with widespread strikes, but sorting them out is, of course, the government's job and the train strikes are perhaps the longest running and the most bitter it looked at one point this week like the government might come to an agreement with the train drivers unions as left but it didn't last here are the union bosses talking a bit earlier on we're further away than when we started okay, that's clear uh mr ward i wouldn't disagree with that okay mr lynch uh, i wouldn't be able to say it depends on discussions i don't I'm not going to use a scale, but we haven't got an agreement, and until we get an agreement, we're not close to it, really. Well, are we close to it or not? Let's ask the man who knows, the Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, who's here. Could there be a deal this week? Well, look, I, I don't want to put an artificial timetable or deadline on it, but, I mean, look, since I became Transport Secretary, what I've tried to do is change the, the tone of the discussions. I sat down with each of the, the union leaders, the, the three that you saw in, in that clip there, uh, and tried to set up a... a, a way we could actually get to a solution and uh, myself and the rail minister have been facilitating negotiations and I think it's right that those detailed talks to thrash out a deal take place between Network Rail, the train operating companies uh, and the trade unions and I, and I very much hope that they can do that. But do you feel a bit cheerier though because the last time you were here it seems pretty much like there was you know you were banging your head on one side of a brick wall and the unions were banging their head on the other side of a well, brick look, wall. We, I mean, are you optimistic well, now? Well I think it'd be fair to say look we've got, so we've got talks uh, it, it, underway. There's been some detailed talks this last week between the RMT uh, and Network Rail mm -hmm. and the train operating companies. There are more talks to come mm -hmm. and that's how ultimately you get a deal and it's really important we get one both for the travelling public, people on the railway mm -hmm. but also for the taxpayer. And can you though confirm what has been <clears throat> widely reported is that there is a higher pay offer that's been put on the table and I, and I ask this I know you won't want to confirm specific detail but can you confirm that more money has been put on the table. That's been widely reported, Mark Harper. Well, look, I made sure when I met, after I met the trade union leaders that there was a, a, a better deal uh, on so, the yes. table for rail workers. Um, but remember, there's, a, there's another side to it, which I think we've talked about mm -hmm. before, which is also it's important that we get generational reform, mm -hmm. both on the maintenance side of the operation for network rail, but also for the, the rail companies. I want a proper seven-day railway mm -hmm. where you don't have to run a rail service by depending on the goodwill of people turning up on their days off. I want a re reliable railway, mm -hmm. seven days a week, that passengers can count on, mm -hmm. um, and that's that way we'll be able to recover some of the reduction in volume of passengers that we've seen since the pandemic. But with that desire for reform, and what I think you've confirmed is more money on the table, again, are you optimistic that there could be a deal this week? Well, look, I hope that there'll be a deal. Um, I'm not going to put an artificial timetable on it. I think as soon as you start putting artificial deadlines on things, mm -hmm. you tend to end up with a bad deal. But look, mm -hmm. I think both the companies and the rail unions are keen to reach an agreement, but we've got to see if they can hammer out, hammer out the detail. But that's for them to do. That I facilitated you know, an offer, I've mm -hmm. brought the two sides together with the Rail Minister, he's been having regular meetings to make sure that we've got a good process and it's for the two sides now to, to hammer out a deal and try and get somewhere where, where they can agree. I think our viewers will hear actually you are sounding quite optimistic, I know you don't want to you know, make yourself a hostage to fortune but it's definitely a change in tone. Um, but one of the key areas in the dispute is this idea of driver only operation on trains. Now that's one of the changes that the companies and the government has wanted the unions to accept. But how can it ever be safe 
for only a trained driver to be on duty? What about a young woman traveling alone late at night on a train or a disabled passenger who needs help? And the only member of staff there is somebody who quite rightly, of course, has to concentrate on driving the train. How can that ever be safe? Well, well look, first of all, driver only operation is, is not a new thing. It's mm -hmm. been on trains, um, frankly, since I was a teenager, mm -hmm. which is tragically but quite a long time ago. But very specific concerns about expanding this and making it normal well, on long distance routes, well, for example. 55% of passengers who use the railway already travel on services where there are driver only operations. So this isn't a new thing. Mm -hmm. And we have quite strict re regulations in the rail sector with the Office for Road and Rail about safety. So this is a perfectly sensible, safe reform. But look, I want to look at reform in a wider package. You've picked on one aspect mm -hmm. of reform there. That's but what the government's, the government's been clear that we need reform overall. Now, the detail of that reform, exactly which bits of reform we're focusing on and what we get in return for the pay rise, that's for the unions and the employers but to hammer out. Like that but reform, reform is a non-negotiable part of this deal. We've got to have generational reform. That's the way you free up the money generates the savings that then can pay for a pay rise for people who work on the railways that's fair to the taxpayer. Now one area where there may be <coughs> new strikes, the rail strikes have been running for a long time, but there could now be strikes in schools. You as a backbencher made your concerns about the impact of children missing mm -hmm. school through lockdown clear on many, many occasions. How could you as a government allow school strikes to happen where we might see the same thing, kids being forced to stay at home and missing lessons? Well, well look, we, we don't know uh, what's going to happen yet. We, we've seen some speculation in the newspapers. One, one it's a bit trade, more than speculation. Well, I mean, there's a ballot and we're going to get a well, result. Yeah, but we don't, know what, like but we don't know what the result is. And in fact, the only ballot we've had so far was a union where actually they didn't reach the threshold to have strikes. But look, mm. if there were strikes in schools, and as a result, children were to lose out on education, that would be incredibly regrettable. Um, that's why the government has been keen to talk and listen to trade unions. My colleague, the Education Secretary, sat down this last week with the trade unions to set out the evidence that the government's going to put before the pay review bodies, to listen to the concerns of trade unions. We want to have a sensible dialogue. We've put extra money into schools. Mm -hmm. um, there was a pay deal um, for teachers that we accepted the the independent pay review bodies and that's that we think is the right process but rather than rather than this industrial dispute i want to make sure children don't have their education damaged they did suffer um, mm -hmm. through covid for not being in school we know what some of the consequences of that were but would i think it be, it'd be regrettable would it be fair on children and on parents if teachers went on strike? Well, I, I think it would be uh, regrettable if there were a strike. I don't want to see children's education disrupted at all. What we want to see is them in school being taught by our fantastic teachers and, mm -hmm. and led by those head teachers in schools. That's what I want to see continue. I think the right way to resolve these disputes is to have those discussions. Mm -hmm. I, it was right that we wrote to union leaders and, and various of sectors of state sat around the table this week, and that's what I want to see happen going and forward. Some of our viewers might think it was a bit late, actually, yeah. after strikes have already been up and running in many sectors, but I'd want to ask you about another important subject we've talked a lot about this morning, and to Keir Starmer, mm -hmm. about the change to the law that the Scottish Government yep. has made, which will make it possible for people officially to change their gender at the age of 16. Would you like to see the Westminster government that you're part of block that legislation? Well, well look, the Prime Minister set out the position very clearly this week when he was in Scotland. The decision will be for the government. That's mm -hmm. technically a decision for the Scottish Secretary. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we're waiting to see is some detailed legal advice mm -hmm. about the impact of that legislation on the rest of the UK. As came out in your interview, mm -hmm. what we have to do when any piece of legislation is passed by the Scottish Parliament is look at the impact on the wider legislative picture in the UK. So we're waiting for that detailed legal advice and then the government will take a decision based on that. And I understand advice. that final legal advice will land with the <coughs> government tomorrow, but on principle, do you, as an individual politician, think that it is right that people should be able officially to change their gender at the age of 16 without a medical diagnosis. Do you believe that's correct? Well, look, that was a decision that the Scottish um, government said. That's and not we what. Decision, yeah, yeah. But I'm, but I'm we're asking not, you on principle, well, though. We're not. Cover. Well, we're not proposing to make those changes um, for uh, for England. Um, but what we have to do is make a decision about whether that legislation mm -hmm. impacts on legislation elsewhere in the UK. And one of those pieces of legislation, for example, is the Equality Act. Mm -hmm. That's why we need a detailed analysis of that. And that's the information that the government needs before it can then take a decision. Because we are, we are conscious, you know, the, 
the decision has been taken by the Scottish Parliament. Mm -hmm. We've got to look at the impact on the rest of the UK, and that's what we're waiting to see before that decision is taken. We're doing it carefully because this is, you know, these are subjects I think which are best approached with care. There are conflicting rights involved in this discussion, yes. and that's why I think it's sensible for the government to take the, but, the but, decision but in a careful, about, thoughtful way. Talking about treating it with care, though, I mean, your <coughs> colleague Caroline Noakes, an experienced MP, former minister herself, she told us a few minutes ago that people in your party were using this issue to stir things up in an inappropriate way. What do you say to her? Well, look, I think the government has been very careful about how we talk about this. Look, there are conflicting rights here. There are, there are trans people who uh, have suffered discrimination um, uh, and want their rights respected. But equally, I've listened very carefully to the concerns that many women, had ha women have had about worries that they've got about risks to their safety. And I heard, you know, Brian Cox and you were just talking there about some of the things J.K. Rowling has said. She said some very reasonable things that people are entitled to say, and she's been treated very badly in response. And I think this discussion is best if we talk about it thoughtfully and carefully, which is why the government's not rushing to a conclusion, but it's waiting to see that detailed legal advice and will then take a careful, thought-through decision which we will then announce. OK, well, some people say a careful thought through decision, if you try to block it, might end up with a huge constitutional bust up with the SNP in, and the Scottish Government. But we've run out of time for now. Mark Harper, thank you so Pleasure. much thank for you. coming in this morning. We'll be watching carefully to see what happens on this issue and the train strikes. Thank you very much. Now, as it comes towards the end of the programme, time has zipped by. It's nearly 10 o'clock. Let's remind ourselves how we started this morning, asking if Keir Starmer is ready to be your next Prime Minister. This was his pitch. There's nothing worse than being in opposition. I've been in opposition all the time I've been in Parliament. That means we vote, we lose, we don't change lives. We need to be a party capable of going into power. Keir Starmer there a few minutes ago. Final word from our panel. Caroline, do you think we now know what the next general election campaign is going to look like. We're going to have the Conservatives sort of grappling with lots of complicated issues and finding it quite hard to keep on the agenda and Labour increasing in confidence. No, I don't think we know what it's going to look like. I think uh, Labour is still very quiet on the issues that they're actually going to campaign on. We haven't seen their policies yet. I think there is a great raft of don't knows out there in the country, mm -hmm. people who ha simply haven't made their mind up yet. What is absolutely true to say is that oppositions do not win elections, governments lose them. And so my uh, hope over the coming months is that the Conservatives pull together, that we hear more from sensible voices like Mark Harper. I think he's always very measured and clever and in what he says. Who? Well, more from Mark I Harper think and less from I want to hear less from those who are seeking to sow division and discord and want change and upheaval just for the sake of it. OK, Howard, do you think any politicians yet being really clear and, and honest about what needs to happen to the economy? Well, I think um, if I were the opposition, I'd be keeping my powder dry at the moment because mm. there's a huge amount of uncertainty. We don't know how inflation will go. The World Bank has just said we're likely to move into a much slower global economy. There's a war on, um, which could have very unpredictable consequences. So I think I would be pretty cautious mm. about saying what I would do in an election in two weeks' time, never, never mind in 18 <laughs> months' time. But, yet, but yes or no, do you think taxes are going to keep going up, whoever wins, because of the situation we're in? Yeah, I think so, because I think the, um, uh, the flexibility the government has got mm -hmm. whilst meeting a, f a fiscally stable position over a medium term is very small. OK, well, that might be bad news, I'm afraid, for viewers for their pay packets. They might see more going out of it from Tatch. But, Brian, can you close us with something to look forward to? The new series of succession is coming to can you spill what terrible nefarious acts no, Logan Roy I can't, gets up to I have signed so many NDAs <laughs> we won't them. tell anyone it's no, only no, no, the three I'm not allowed to say a thing you know <laughs> my uh, job is in jeopardy if I do <laughs> is it good though I think it's all good and I think it's going to be pretty exciting but uh, that's it. <laughs> OK, well, that's it also from us this morning. Thank you all three of you so much for coming in and spending the last 60 minutes with us. In the last seven days, we've heard on the programme why the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition think they deserve your vote. Keir Starmer increasingly seems to believe he can win. 
focus on using this chance that the Tories' turmoil has given him and his party and whether or not people are really up for bold reforms of the health service. And Labour is carefully trying to piece together its pitch to you, which will grow over the coming months. But poll leads can disappear in a flash. Some of Sir Keir's critics on his own side reckon he's not grabbing the opportunity firmly enough. And for all the angst, Rishi Sunak, as we've heard from Caroline Noakes, is not going to just chuck it all away without a fight. The general election is strangely both near and far. But with a clash coming over the Constitution and our culture, this time next week we hope to speak to Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP chief, in the next of our leader interviews. But until then, please let us know what's on your mind in all the usual ways, and you can catch up with anything you missed on iPlayer as always. Until then, thanks for watching, have a great week, and I'll see you next time.